uh, we might make a start. Welcome to the Living with Disability Research Seminar for July. I'd like to acknowledge that we're on the uh, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation in Victoria um, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, the seminar this afternoon is uh, is part of a large research program that Jacinta and I have been uh, undertaking probably for about the last 10 years um, and it's the culmination of, of one piece of that work and then it's it's the testing um, of another piece of that that work. So I hope it's uh, interesting. Um, so if you haven't been before, you if you want to ask a question or make a comment, you need to do that in the Q&A and we'll have lots of time for questions. Um, we'll have Jacinta will speak first uh, for about half an hour or so, and then there'll be time for Q&A. So put your Q&A things in the box as we go. Um, then we'll have a very short break around four o'clock, and then I'll be the second uh, speaker. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Jacinta Douglas, who many of you I'm sure are familiar with. She's now an Emeritus Professor, Jacinta Douglas. Um, and I think she's working twice as hard now as she did when she was at La Trobe, and that's quite an achievement for anybody, if anybody knows how hard she works in the first place. Um, however, she's going to talk about the development and the preliminary evaluation of the decision support questionnaire, which is a very important measurement tool. So I'm going to hand over to you, Jacinta. Thank you so much, Chris. And it's lovely to be here this afternoon and talking to you all about this uh, we endeavour of ours that is, is in some ways never ending. And as Chris said, I'm going to talk to you about the development and the preliminary evaluation of the decision support questionnaire, which we um, developed to be able to measure whether or not training or interventions or programs had an impact on how people were supporting people with cognitive disability in their decision making. So that's the, the journey we're on for this first part of, of this afternoon's um, seminar. And it would be really nice if it, there we go. This work that Chris and I started now a long time ago <laughs> in many ways, really um, gets its inspiration from two pieces of important um, both legislation and a convention, an international convention, that really set the scene for considering how much or how important it was for people with cognitive disability or people with disability generally to be able to participate in decision making about their own life, just as we do. So the first documentation that's really important here is the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability um, in 2006. And you can see that if this is Article 12, that in Article 12, it states very clearly that persons with disabilities enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis with others in all aspects of life. It also says that signatory nations, and of course, Australia is one of those signatory nations, agree to develop appropriate measures to provide access by persons with disabilities to the support they may require in exercising that legal capacity. Because unless there is support for some people, then in fact, that legal capacity remains out of their reach. Then in 2014, the, the Australian Law Reform Commission um, released their report and they pretty much um, endorsed that all their recommendations were in line with the convention. So they've, the, the two important parts or recommendations out of that Law Reform Commission were this one here, the first one on the slide, persons who require support in decision-making must be provided with access to support necessary for them to make, communicate and participate in decisions. So you can see how this lines up with the access component of the um, Convention on the Rights of People with Disabilities. And the 
important second aspect of the ALC um, recommendations here was that the will preferences and rights of persons who may require decision-making support must direct decisions that affect their lives. And that introduction of the concept of the person's will, their preferences and their rights must direct the overall support for decision-making is a really important one for us and triggered very much of the work that, that we set out to do around being able to provide appropriate support to actually meet those needs. And you can see just quickly how important support really is. If we just highlight support on these slides, you can see that it's really important and it is very much linked to the person's will preferences and rights. So that's where we're going. And when you think about support for decision-making, it's, it's pretty complex, complex construct. It enables people with cognitive disabilities to participate in making decisions about their own life. It empowers a person to gain life experience in making choices and exercising control based on their will and, prefer and preferences. As I said, it's a complex multifaceted process. And our Latrobe Support for Decision-Making Practice Framework provides the only, to our knowledge, the only evidence-based guide for engaging in effective support for decision-making with people with cognitive disability. So it's a pretty important process that we're talking about. And it's important to not only have a framework, but also to be able to measure the impact of that framework on practice. So when we did, just to give you a bit of a background on the development of our practice framework, because that's really important also with respect to the development of the disability support questionnaire. We began this process with a literature review, with a comprehensive li literature review about support for decision-making with people with cognitive disabilities. And that's phase one of this overall, um, if you like, development of a complex intervention in a sense. And we identified 54 papers that were relevant and we looked at those papers and we extracted what was important information about support, about support strategies, about the things that made support work and the things that got in the way, if you like. Phase two, we actually went to the source. We talked to people who actually provided support and we talked to people who received support. So we conducted seven studies overall that, that gave rise to 13 published um, articles. And those studies used a, a grounded theory, constructivist um, qualitative methodology. They were really important in giving us that lived experience for both the supporter and the person they were supporting. And from there, we did a little bit the same as we did with the literature. We identified strategies, we identified facilitators, we identified barriers in the process of providing and receiving support. And then we designed our framework and we designed our framework with um, a group of people who including ourselves, who were, who were really familiar with either the, if you like, developmental cognitive disability space, adults with intellectual disability. Um, there in, the, in that case, that's Chris's expertise. And in my case, it's, the, it's expertise around people with acquired cognitive disability, particularly acquired brain injury. So we designed a framework and we piloted it and then we were able to actually publish what our framework looked like. We tried it. We um, were really lucky to have the support of the Family and Community Services Department in New South Wales who supported us to, to develop this. So we had funding to do that preliminary work and set up a framework that was then ready for extensive evaluation. And that's phase four of our program, which we have finished. And that luckily was supported by an ARC linkage project, which gave us the funding and gave us the ability to have the sort of 
man and woman power to actually do the evaluation. So that's the background. That's where this comes from. And just as I said, really, the DSQ was developed to be able to evaluate our framework. Does it make a difference? Is it useful for people who, who actually are educated, are trained in the practice framework to show whether or not it changes their behaviour? So this is the framework, and I'm not going to spend a long time on this at all. You can see it here. It has seven steps. And we depicted it in a circle because it's actually not a linear process. It's really hard to get um, two-dimensional <laughs> um, figures that show that. So we chose a circle or we chose a wheel in the sense of being able to give you the idea that it's a dynamic framework. It's not necessarily I do this step and then I do this step, although it's really important, important to cover all of the steps. So you need to be able to manoeuvre your way around, if you like, this wheel, this wheel of support for decision-making fortune. It also is informed by three really, really important principles that came out of our analysis of data and our analysis of the literature. And the first principle there is commitment, and that's commitment to provide support to the person and to provide support to the person over time and in different situations. It also identifies that orchestration is important and orchestration implies that, if you like, quality support for decision-making is not dependent on just one person. It really requires that conducting of a support group of people. And that really makes a difference because providing support for decision making at a high quality level is quite, um, it's quite a, a demanding task. And we need to consider that people need a support network around them to be able to engage in that good, if you like, supported decision making. And finally, it's really important for supporters to both reflect and review on how they are providing support. That's that sort of, if you like, um, central tenant of good practice, wherever you're practicing, make sure you reflect on what you're doing and make sure you review the outcomes of your input or your support here. You can actually um, go to the website here for the um, framework. We have online learning modules that we developed that you can access freely and you can work your way through to, to actually see how the process works in more detail. The important thing for us in the development of the uh, decision support questionnaire is the fact that decision support is developed through or via strategies that are tailored to that person. That's why we, all, we start with making sure you know the person you're supporting. So strategies are a really important part of the process. And in a sense, that's what underpins for us being able to evaluate our practice framework is dependent on being able to measure how people are using strategies and whether or not there's a change in how they use strategies and the frequency with which they use strategies. So that's where we were at. And that kind of leads us to the aim for, for this presentation today. Our aim at the beginning of this part of our process was to develop and complete preliminary psychometric evaluation of a self-report questionnaire that would enable supporters of people with cognitive disability to identify what strategies they use and to identify the frequency with which they use those strategies. Pretty straightforward. And if we were able to develop a psychometrically reliable and valid measure, then it would enable researchers and program developers to measure the support strategies used by the supporters they're working with and to assess whether or not any training specific impact on the capability of supporters to be effective supporters was evident in the training they were delivering. So it has a sort of twofold um, goal and that is to be able to 
and to be able to identify strategies and to see whether or not when we're trying to change those strategies, we make a difference. So this is the development of the DSQ um, in a nutshell. It took a lot longer than it looks like on one slide. Firstly, as I said, we did our item um, content and selection. We looked at strategies through our research. We looked at the experiences of people with cognitive disabilities and their supporters. We worked with people with intellectual disability and people with acquired cognitive disability and those who support them. And as I said, that, that required seven studies, a whole range of studies, and those references are all available, most of them in open access um, in those 13 published papers. So a lot of really dense, but really informative data. We then developed the questionnaire and the questionnaire has 32 items. It uses a modified Likert type scale with four possible levels of response for each question. So when I ask you a question about how often you use a strategy, you can say never or rarely, sometimes, often, or usually or always. So you've got a four point choice there. And change in fre frequency of strategy use can be monitored over time. And, and as I said, in response to participation in training programs. These are the instructions that are sit at the top of the DSQ in the sense of when a person is looking at the questionnaire. So the following questions ask about providing support for decision-making for every question, please circle the response which best answers the question where the four frequency choices are. And the participant is reminded to make sure that they consider all the decision support situations they have encountered with the person they support. So it's across a range of types of decision because the type of decision may make a difference. It's really giving us a holistic or a global view of those support strategies. This is the questionnaire as it looks when somebody is is filling it in so you can see some of the items here when supporting and you can put the person's name in when supporting Jacinta to make decisions do you weigh up the advantages and disadvantages of options with the person check make sure that the person understands what's involved in the decision etc um, all the way down do you think about how you as a supporter might be unduly influencing or influencing the decision. So we're getting uh, a pretty full picture of what's happening. When we evaluate our data and we evaluate whether or not um, this is a useful measure, firstly, we looked at content reliability and that is internal consistency where we evaluate the degree to which the items are all measuring that same underlying construct of support for decision-making. That is those support for decision-making support strategies, if you like. Um, we used the index for internal consistency we used was Cronbach's coefficient alpha, which gives you an average co correlation among the items of any measure. And here, of course, it's the DSQ. The recommended range for a reliable measure is a Cronbach alpha of between 0 0.7 and 0 0.9. There's a bit of evidence that suggests if you get a really, really high 0.99 Cronbach alpha, then it means that you've got a lot of redundancy in your items, that there are items that are actually just um, replicating another item rather than adding new information. Once you've established content reliability of a measure that says, okay, we're measuring something and the thing we're measuring, we're measuring relatively reliably, is to think about the, what's called the construct validity. And the construct validity is we're measuring, yes, we're measuring something reliably, but are we measuring what we think we're measuring? So are we measuring the person's support for decision-making strategies or are we, measure, are we measuring how tired they are, for example? So construct validity is really important. It says it's, it tells us that a measure can be used to give not only reliable information, but valid information about a particular construct. That is the ability to accurately 
what we chose to look at here was was what was important for us is if somebody had gone through a training program was our measure able to accurately assess whether they had changed in outcome around their support strategies was there a an effect based on doing the training the most convincing evidence is often called this responsivity or this sensitivity to change because it means not only does the does the scale or the measure measure a particular construct but it says does it also measure change in that construct when you when you would normally expect change particularly in our case after an effective intervention and we looked at the degree to which the DSQ item, so at the item level, changed in what we perceived as the theoretically proposed direction following the intervention. So we expected items to move in one direction or the other, depending on the actual content of the item. You can ask me any questions um, when we finish if this isn't making sense, okay? So here are the results. Often results clarify things. Um, firstly, just to let you know, we're going to start with that content reliability study. And in that study, um, in this preliminary work, we had 39 participants, and I'll talk to you about those participants. And then we'll look at the construct validity. And here we had two studies, one very small study with support co coordinators and a second study with 23 um, supporters who were in the parental role with the people they were supporting. Okay, so start with reliability. Remember, are we actually measuring the same thing on the items within this questionnaire? We had 30, men, 30 women and nine men, 31 supported adults with intellectual disability, eight supported adults with acquired brain injury or acquired cognitive disability. The average age um, of these participants was 52 years um, with an age range of 24 to 71 years. The support roles that they were in with the people they were supporting covered a whole range of roles. We had 19 people who were in the parental role, two were who were in the partnership role, 15 support workers, two siblings and one adult child. The adults they supported had an average age of 34 years with a range of 18 to 64 years. And the average length of relationship between the supporter and the person they were supporting was 20 years. We had a minimum of the relationship having to be at least one year in duration. And the range we had was one to 50 years. And in quite a number of the cases, particularly in the parental cases, the person had known the person, the, the supporter had known the person they were supporting all their lives. So here's the result and, and you know, a little bit of silent applause from us. We were very happy to see that the reliability albeit with a small group of participants in this first preliminary evaluation, um, we had a COMBAX alpha of 0.812. And when we look at that based on standardized items, it's 0.821. And that was across our 32 items. We had a 95% confidence interval of, of 0.72 to 0.89, again, well within the recommended ranges for acceptable, in fact, for very good reliability in this case. So it has a high internal consistently, consistently see, with low random error in the scores. And that's important because you don't, there's always going to be error variance when somebody fills in a questionnaire. It doesn't matter actually how good it is, but you don't want a huge amount of error variance because if you get change in that error variance it may simply reflect that the person had a better sleep the night before had a nicer meal um, didn't have so much to do at work that day so what we've established in this small study is that we've got reliability and remembering that an instrument can't be valid unless it is reliable we then said okay 
forward, upwards and onwards, if you like, to validity. So construct validity in the way that we looked at it, did I let, no, I didn't miss anything out, it was responsivity or sensitivity to change. And that question is, does the DSQ have the ability to accurately assess change in an outcome following training based on the research support for decision-making practice framework? So we had developed a practice framework, we had developed a training that could be delivered. And our question here was, does this questionnaire identify change post-training? We had two studies, as I said at the very beginning. The first one was, um, and the first study we did looking at validity was with a group of 10 support coordinators of adults with acquired cognitive disability due to severe traumatic brain injury. So these were support coordinators who were employed by the Transport Accident Commission here in Victoria. Our guiding hypothesis was that changes would reflect improved use of supported decision-making principles and strategies. Um, in the second study, we have parents of adults with intellectual disability, 23 participants in this study, and again, our item, we had item-specific hypotheses that specified change in 19, 19 items and no change in 13 items. We'll go back to that when we look at each one of them. So here we are with our 10 support coordinators, nine women and one man from the Transport Accident Commission. They all held tertiary level health professional qualifications. They were very experienced in supporting people with acquired cognitive disability, in supporting people with traumatic brain injuries. Seven of them had more than 10 years experience and three of them had less than five years experience. They were currently managing traffic accident commission claims of adult clients aged between 18 to 65 years with a principal diagnosis of acquired brain injury. And in the context they were working with, the people they were working with, they were working with the individual to develop, implement and review their plan. And that's, if you like, a life goal plan with goals for activities, goals for um, immediate change and goals for more longer term change. Um, the role of the support coordinator went across different components of the TAC service provision. Um, four of them worked in what's called the early um, stage of, of people working with the TAC themselves after a, a, an accident and a brain injury. That means that's sort of in the acute and post-acute stage of rehabilitation. Three of them were in the active group, and that's um, people who are receiving ongoing rehabilitation support or life support. It, um, by life support, I mean living support in the community. Um, and those people may be receiving support about um, where they were going to live, what they were going to do, who they were going to live with, etc. Um, one of them was in the return to work area of support coordination, and that explains itself. They were supporting people to think about returning to the work environment, changing their work, looking at their vocational future, if you like. Um, one of them was a specialist, particularly working with people who had um, behavioural complications that um, may impact on them being able to live easily with support in the community. And finally, the final participant was a team manager. A range of roles here and with a range of clients at the TAC. In study one, um, as I said, we had the 10 support coordinators. We've talked about that and we've talked about their experience and we've talked about who they were working with. And in study two, we had 23 parents who regularly provided decision support for their adult child. In study two, they were aged between 47 to 74 years with a mean of 58 years. Um, 18 of them were mothers. 
18 of the 23. Um, the adults they supported ranged in age from 18 to 39 years. Most of the adults lived at home with one or both of their parents and a parent um, severity of intellectual disability ranged from profound to mild. Okay, let's look at some results. Always the best fun. Um, this is study one results and it looks at support coordinators pre versus post training strategy use. And these are the strategies on the DSQ and the blue is the pre-training um, frequency of use of that particular strategy and the orange is the post-training frequency of use of a strategy. What we found here was we had significant change with a, at, at a level of less than 0.05, remembering we've got a very small sample size on seven items. And there was a trend towards change on a further five items. So in a sense, that's, that's quite, that's promising with respect to one, we've got a small sample size, but also that we're actually being able to pick up change in how, how these support coordinators are actually providing support. It was interesting that they reported reduced reliance on interpreted best interest and increased reliance on a person's preferences. And that, if you like, is essential is probably the essential item for us with respect to support for decision making or supported decision making. That in the person isn't saying, okay, I can make a decision for this adult based on my conceptualization, conceptualization of what is in their best interest. No, what they're saying is they're relying more on understanding the person's preferences and being able to reflect that person's preferences in how they support them. There was a move towards practice that supported the client's right to participate in decision making. And in this context, you know, that's quite a significant change because where for the most part, these support coordinators are working with people with a very severe acquired brain injury. And it's really important that despite the fact that the person may have what are called a lot of executive function problems, these support coordinators are recognising how important it is to support the person's right to participate in decision-making about their own life. They were checking the client wants to be supported to make the decision, and that was, for some of them, quite a revelation that they should check that, that this person would like to be supported. Um, and again, a really positive move. They were considering the significance of the decision and the consequences of the outcome with the client, not for the client. And again, that's a really important change in practice. They were not choosing for the person. And I can say having worked with, um, worked in the area of, of traumatic brain injury for goodness knows more than about 40 years or so, I can say that a lot of the time decisions in the past have been made for the person, not with the person. Working, they, they work through each of the steps involved in the decision with the person. In fact, our little our, our will became really important to them and a checklist that we developed so that they could review their practice was being used regularly. I did mentoring sessions with each of these coordinators afterwards to talk about difficulties they were having or difficult um, difficulties they were having with particular people they were working with. And that was really clear that being able to review and reflect had become very much part of their work. And they were considering their own potential influence in the situation. Again, that's really important so that you're not, you know, coercing somebody to make a decision that fits your perspective. It may be that fits to make your job easier, that they were really considering how they were influencing the, the situation. And these changes, as you can see, as we've discussed them, these seven changes reflected improved use of supported decision-making principles and strategies. So a bit of a hurrah, again, that in fact, yes, only 10 people, but it had made a difference um, across those 10 people as a group. Let's see how 
the DSQ fears then with, with working with parents um, pre and post training in strategy use with respect to, again, using allotrope support for decision-making practice framework. Remembering here, we're looking at responsivity, the ability to measure or assess change due to intervention. It's an indicator of construct validity. It assesses the degree to which the items changed in the theoretically proposed direction yet again. And it's a comparative um, evaluation of pre versus post training strategy use. We, um, Chris and I looked at this and we actually made specific hypotheses or directional hypotheses here for 10 items. We hypothesized that 10 items would show increased frequency of use, that nine items would show decreased frequency of use, and 13 would show no change. Again, working with parents, you're working with a group of people who know the person very, very well and who have been working with them for a long time or have been supporting their decision making. Um, some people would say that parenting is like a job, but they're actually supporting their, their um, adult children to, to participate in, dec in decision making. So this is these are the findings here. And these are the strategies that we expected to increase after training. And you can see if you firstly just look at what's happening, you can actually see that here, 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 and here, we have change. You can see here, this one, let me find it again. Where's it gone? Maybe it's not on this slide, maybe it's on the next slide. So we have but yeah, we do. We have this one here. Think about the decision with respect to the person's life goal actually reduced a little bit, which surprised me when I analysed this data. Um, but it's, it's not a significant, significant um, reduction at all. So it's staying around the same. So the other items have a tendency to stay around the same level. And you can see here, hopefully, what each of these items is measuring. I think it's important that, that parents are able to review similar situations, that they point out a range of options, not just one. And that was a really positive change for the, for the parents who participated here. They considered the consequences with the person, not for the person, that they weighed up advantages and disadvantages of options with the person. So this further inclusion, this increase in, in frequency of including the, their adult child in the discussion around supported decision making was really important. Now let's have a look at um, have I lost one? Let me see if we've got a decrease. Uh, I've got a summary for you. When we look at our hypotheses, we said 10 items would show increased frequency of use and nine would show decreased frequency of use and 13 would show no change. When we look at the results, eight out of the 10 items showed increased frequency of use and half of those showed a significant increase. Nine items we said would decrease and nine strategies show decreased frequency of use, but only a third of those showed a significant decrease frequency of use over the time that we evaluated. 13 items we said would not change, and in fact, 15 items did not change. So overall, 30 out of the 32 items changed as hypothesized. Not all of them significantly, but in the, in the anticipated or hypothesized direction. So we have some good evidence here for construct validity and for being able to complete the validity evaluation of the DSQ with a much larger group of people. What was really exciting about this too, though, was that supporters' confidence to provide support for decision-making um, increased significantly from pre-training to post-training. These supporters felt much more confident about what they were doing when they were providing support. So, with respect to what we learned, 
we learned that we had a good change in support practice for support coordinators. They also had a significant increase in confidence. We also are really pleased to report that the TAC have taken on and worked with us to specifically tailor training to meet the needs of of support work of support coordinators we've developed case scenarios there's an online resource that has been developed within the TAC um, there's an internal community of practice that's been set up with um, learning lunches etc they have really adopted and included our support for decision making framework within their work practices we hope to be able to see if we can actually expand that to include families, other health professionals and support workers who work in that context. Thank you. Very much. Oh, thank you very much, Jacinta. Um, I think you have an art of explaining the complicated uh, quite simply, and I hope that made sense to people. It's it takes a bit to get your head around the sort of statistical processes, doesn't it? Welcome back. Hopefully we had a chance for a wee stretch. And um, it is now my pleasure to, to introduce the Director of the Living with Disability Research Centre at La Trobe University, Professor Christine Bigby, who I think you all know. Um, and Chris is somebody who has had um, a long career in making a difference in the field of disability. So we're very privileged to be able to actually have Chris with us today to talk to us about evaluation of a structured decision-making framework used by the public trustee in Queensland. Thanks, Chris. And remember to put your questions in the Q&A and, we'll, uh, and we'll go through those questions at the end of the presentation. Thank you, Chris. Okay, so if you my my presentation follows very logically from from Jacinta's, and it's basically another eva evaluation of training in supportive decision making. Um, this case by another large uh, public organisation, the Public Trustee in Queensland. Let me just see if I can move this on. So. I'm not going to spend much time talking about the background because Jacinta did some of that in her presentation. But as you know, there's been a significant shift in thinking about the way we think about decision making and decision support for people with intellectual disabilities um, and, and other types of cognitive disability. So Jacinta's already talked about the UN Convention, which emphasizes that everybody uh, enjoys legal capacity, should enjoy legal capacity on an equal basis, including people with disabilities. Um, and that signatory nations to the UN Convention should agree and to develop appropriate measures to provide access for people with disabilities to the support that they need to exercise their legal capacity. In 2014, the UN Committee um, uh, issued a, a, a sort of an interpretive statement about uh, the UN Convention and, and Article 12, which is the article that talks about um, legal capacity. And it recommended there should be the abolition of substitute decision making, and that all uh, people, uh, states that had signed up to the convention should abolish substitute decision making and introduce supported decision making measures. Australia uh, chose a different interpretation, but nevertheless has been uh, reforming its provisions for substitute decision making. So it hasn't uh, removed them, but it's been introducing uh, reforms around the way substitute decision making is done. And it's been slowly introducing reforms around supported decision making too. So in Victoria, uh, we now have provisions uh, for somebody to uh, appoint a supportive guardian or, or a supportive administrator to support somebody to make decisions. There's all sorts of issues with those provisions because um, you need capacity, uh, you need to be deemed to have capacity in order to, to make those, but the bar has been lowered in terms of what that capacity might look like. Um, but in Queensland, and this is sort of where 
this study occurs, um, there was a Human Rights Act uh, in 2019, and that from that there followed an amendment to the Guardianship and Administration Act uh, in 2000. And these two pieces of legislation are really clear that the Queensland public sector bodies have a duty in, in the way they carry out their work to promote and safeguard the rights of, of people with disabilities in ways that are least restrictive of, of their rights. Now, the Queensland legislation use this term structured decision-making um, that can be used or must be used by people when they're promoting people's rights uh, and making decisions with people. It resembles almost like 100% the principles of supported decision-making. And it's still a bit of a mystery, I think, why that term structured structured decision making was introduced. I'm sure somebody must understand that, but it's it's rather confusing. But what, what essentially uh, the essence of that legislation says is that um, all people acting in the public sector must recognize and provide preserve the right of people to make their own decisions. And if possible, an adult must be supported to make their own decision. Um, so you should avoid substitute decisions. Um, and that if you're supporting somebody to make a decision, you must take account of people's views, wishes and preferences. And that if you can't ascertain what those might be, instead of using best interest, you use substituted ju judgment, which means you, you work out what, it, what, the, what, you, what your interpretation or what your understanding of the person's preferences might be or would be around that decision if they were able to communicate them to you. So there's a very clear shift towards people's rights and towards ideas around supported decision-making, even if you're acting in the role of a substitute decision-maker. So for those of you who aren't from Queensland, um, the, the Queensland Public Trustee is, is much like the Public Trustee's office, uh, offices that, that exist in every state. They provide financial administration for people, and this is their language, with impaired decision-making capacity. Um, and they're often appointed by tribunals. So in the Queensland, it's the Queensland uh, QCAT, um, which appoints them as a financial administrator to be in fact a substitute decision-maker maker for the person who's, um, who's concerned. Um, but in Queensland, the public trustee also deals with making wills, with deceased estates, with managing investments and trusts. So it's got broader functions than just acting as a financial administrator. Um, and if you look on their website, you, you can see phrases like, the public trustee is a socially and fiscally responsive statutory authority that helps to make decisions that enhance the dignity, rights and interests of Queenslanders. So when the new legislation was introduced in, um, in 2000, the Queensland Public Trustee started on a journey to start to reorientate its decision-making practice. Um, and it introduced a structured, a structured decision-making framework along with another, a number of other uh, initiatives. And I'm gonna talk about the initiative around structured uh, decision-making. It's really important to bear in mind that the Queensland Public Trustee and the staff who work there in many cases are, have the power to make substitute decisions for a person, but they're bound by the legislation which tells them how they must do that, that they must take account of people's rights, take people's preferences, um, and wherever possible, support the person to make their own decision, even though at the end of the day, the staff member has the right to make the decision for the person. So the Queensland Public Trustee developed this supported decision-making framework and they based it on, on the Latrobe Support for Decision-Making Framework. Um, and they saw it as a way to assist their frontline staff in making better de decisions by having stronger engagement with their customers um, and with their customers' uh, support network. So this was a, a fantastic opportunity then to, to test out how 
the La Trobe Support for Decision Making Framework could be applied to uh, the context of a large uh, public organisation like the Queensland Public Trustee. So their training division, and they had a fantastic training division, um, it worked with us to adapt the La Trobe framework and some of the materials to reflect the requirements of the Human Rights Act and the, the Guardianship and Administration Act, and to put our framework and the examples in the context of, of Queensland and the Queensland Public Trustee and the type of decisions that they supported people to make. And obviously most of those decisions were about people's money, how you spent money, how you access money, um, how, whether you sold property, you know, all of those sorts of financial things. Um, so they did a fantastic job adapting uh, the framework. Um, they didn't substantially change any of the underpinning concepts or any of the steps or the principles um, that Jacinta's already talked about um, that went with our framework. But as I said, they changed the term uh, from supported decision make, support for decision making to structured decision making. But luckily, those two things have the same initials, so we'll talk about it as SDM, and you really won't notice the difference. Um, so they began this process of developing the training and training staff um, in 2020. At the beginning of 2020, I'd gone up there at the end of 2019, and then, you know, COVID happened. Um, and so it took much longer to do the training across their organisation and for us to do this evaluation of the training than anybody had anticipated. But by mid 2021, all the frontline staff across Queensland Public Trustee had been trained in the new supported decision-making framework, as well as the supervisors and the managers. So that was a really good thing about the way they went about it. It wasn't just the frontline workers being trained, it was the supervisors and, and their managers, which is a really, as we know from group homes, it's a re really important way of embedding practice uh, in an organisation. So I'm not quite sure how clear that is, but on, on one side, the multicoloured one uh, is the structured decision-making framework uh, that was developed um, by the training people in QPT. And on the other side is our support for decision-making framework. And you can see how similar they, they look. That people both in talk about the wheel, Jacinta said that people at um, TAC talked about the wheel and how important that was. And the people at QPT retain that sort of structure and they talked about it as a wheel too. Um, so there was some change of language um, on some of the steps, but the essential elements of the framework were kept. So instead of uh, at step three, talking about in our framework, understanding the person's will and preferences for a decision that was simplified to obtaining the customer's views, wishes and preferences. Um, and at step five, in our will, it talks about considering if a formal process is needed. And when you don't have any statutory authority as a decision supporter, as none of the family members had, or most of the family members didn't have, and neither did the TAC support coordinators. They were informal, even though they were paid. They didn't have any authority to make decisions with the person. Um, but actually the QPT people, as I've said, did have uh, authority to make decisions. So there was no need for the QPT people to think, well, do we need to get formal authority? Um, because they, they already had it. So that was a weird sort of step. And, and the way that was, that was built into their structure was to say, okay, this is a point of reflection. Have we followed this process so far? So it was sort of stop, reflect, have you done these earlier steps? And if not, then you need to go back and do them. <coughs> and then the other difference was at step seven, which the Queensland Public Trustee talked about as being actioning and evidencing. So that was the point where they had to evidence, write, document the process that they'd used. Um, whereas in, um, in our framework, it's about implementing the decision and seeking advocates if you need them. 
in order to, to get it implemented. They also um, <laughs> took the principles from the middle and put them around the outside and slightly changed them. So they were commitment, uh, which was, uh, which is still there in terms of commitment to people's rights. Instead of orchestration, they talked about communicate coordination. <coughs> and then they talked about reflection review, which is the same. I'm going to have to drink some more water. Hang on. So in terms of the, <coughs> the evaluation and the aims, our research questions were, what do QPT staff think about the introduction of this new structured decision-making framework? How did they regard it? Did they use the steps and the principles in their everyday work? And has their practice changed as a result of the new framework and the training that they got? We used mixed methods. So we uh, did a series of interviews with staff uh, to explore their experiences of using the training and their perceptions of their new ways of working. And we did a survey of staff pre and post using the DSQ that you've just heard about and using a very simple scale about confidence uh, in supporting people to make decisions. And we, we applied the DSQ uh, before the training and then three to six months after the training. So the people that participated were, were the staff um, and we had, um, we, we had less than we had hoped for, but because of COVID and the time that it took and the pressures that people were under, but we did 18 interviews with staff and we had 160, uh, 100 um, DSQs pre-training and only 38 post-training. And of those, we only had 29 that were sort of match pairs. Uh, but Jacinta reliably tells me that that's enough um, to, to draw some conclusions about the direction of change and what was achieved. But essentially, uh, this is using the DSQ, but it's also using the, the analysis of the qualitative data to identify what was happening. So what did we find? We found that the staff increased uh, significantly their confidence of supporting people to make decisions after the training and that we found that their support changed significantly in the direction that we expected from 12 of the 19 items that we had hypothesized would change. So this is very similar then to the the support coordinators that there was a significant change and there was no significant change on on seven items so as you can see they were much more likely then to consider the consequences of the outcome for the person that they were supporting to make a decision to seek advice from a colleague to check that the person wanted support to rely on what the person wanted uh, to weigh up the advantages and the disadvantages with the person themselves to check that the person understood what was involved in the decision, to work through each of the steps uh, involved in the decision making, and to consider the significance of the decision for the person. They were less likely to make a decision with the person on the spur of the moment, and that's probably a really good sign. Um, they were less likely to choose for the person based on their own knowledge, um, to take the option that the person would least likely resist, and to wait and see what happens over time to procrastinate. So in terms of, of this, the sort of stats, this was a very good outcome that there were significant differences in the way this relatively small group um, supported people to make decisions. And they moved in the direction of, support, of using a much stronger rights-based approach in the way that they supported people to make decisions or made decisions with the person. So how did the staff then think about uh, the change uh, that, that, that they, were, they were part of um, in shifting 
the way they supported people to make decisions. And they talked about that they were, they felt that they were refocusing on people's rights and that the training had really encapsulated this ethos of about a focus on rights. But it was, it was very interesting that there were mixed views then about the extent of change that was actually happening in the organization. Um, some, some people responded to the sense, well, you know, it's just really confirming what we already do. So we're already doing this. The training just reinforces that this is what we're doing. Whereas other people saw this as a completely different approach to what they had been doing. As one person said, well, it tipped everything on its head and had a different approach to it. So obviously people had different assumptions about what their practice was pre the training and pre the introduction of this focus on people's rights. But that's probably really doesn't matter. It's where people end up rather than where they start, which is the important thing. And people talked about having a framework uh, for the work that they did and being more accountable. So there was a sense that for the first time, they really had a structure and a point of reference for providing decision support to the people that they were working with. Um, and you can see as people said, you know, we've got a process in place, we can evidence that we followed that process. And yes, we're covered on both sides. So people felt they were covered in terms of people's rights, but also as public servants, they were also covered in the type of work that they were doing and could could explain and justify what they'd done. And this, this, this framework and process gave them the ability to do that. And again, the wheel pops up as the wheel is extremely valuable. It's everything and it underpins all the general principles that we have to deal with. Um, so there was a strong sense that having this framework, and, and it was really interesting when you think about these type of comments, they're very similar to what the parents said in the, parent, in the qualitative element of the parent study parents really valued having a framework and a process to follow. Um, in terms of the, the training that people had got, they felt it was very well designed, it was valuable, it was participatory, and that it was delivered with enormous energy and enthusiasm. And it was delivered by the staff, by the training staff at, at QPT. Um, they really appreciated the worked examples of the context of which of their work. Uh, so they took a lot of um, the examples that were in the training uh, that's targeted at parents and support workers and, and adapted it to reflect the QPT context. Uh, so they, re they really enjoyed it and they thought it was very positive and that some of the videos were sort of very relevant. But some staff felt, and this is probably really important, that it could have been more tailored to the type of work that QPT staff did. Um, and that's really important in terms of taking something like a generic framework and then adapting it to the particular context that people are working in. So it probably needs some more work in terms of developing more video clips, more worked examples to make it really embedded in, in the work of this organisation. And interestingly enough, some people said, well, it could be more directive. Um, the people providing the training to us had never done this, I guess, and so maybe it was a bit hard for them to relate to some of the issues, some of the time and some of the pressures that we have. And that's a real challenge um, when you're thinking about applying a framework to an individual. It's very hard to be directive and procedural. This means this is about applying principles to each unique individual, which is the heart of being person centered, I guess. Um, so in terms of changing practice um, and applying this new framework, uh, the staff talked about, you know, the change was that customers now are having much more of a say. And they felt that they were using a different language. They were much better at listening to people. They were giving much more careful exploration of the options that might be available to people and that they were trying to ensure that people understood. So one of them said, so you're actually asking them, the customers, you're not telling them. Um, and so they were much more conscious of consulting. Um, and, and, and many of the sort of quotes, which you can read there, reflect that sense of a shift to 
consultation and to asking rather than just directing and telling people what they could and couldn't do, which means it's shifting in that direction of supporting people to make their decisions to be involved in decisions rather than just making them for people. And in terms of orchestration, um, there was a sense that it was a big difference from how they'd done things in the past, um, that a lot of the clients that they worked with uh, couldn't provide much input because of communication or understanding, but that now there was an imperative to go and find the relevant people in somebody's life who could provide some input, who could add to what the, what the, what the workers understood about the person. Um, so, and that's the sort of principle about coordination or orchestration. So I'm just going to very quickly go through some of the elements of the framework. So knowing the person, there was a sense that they had shifted their work from seeing people as files. You know, they used to refer to people as files and there was a sense much more that these were people that they were working with and they had to get to know the person. Um, it's been drummed into us to know the person um, and that people were increasingly looking for multiple sources of information about the person. And this quote just talks about the worker, all the different sources of information that he drew on before then talking to the person um, and finding out who the person, who was in the person's life and then talking to them as well. So trying to build a picture of the person. And they talked about how good it was to have this new technology. So there were many more ways of doing it than in the past. Um, so if somebody couldn't make it in, you could use you could use the phone. And some people talked about using Zoom and Teams. Um, so identifying the need for the decision and describing the need. And this was this was really interesting. There was a sense that people said, well, now we take each request, each uh, request for support to make a decision about somebody's finances separately, rather than just treating it as, oh, this is per this person's asking for money again. You know, we've got a stock standard answer. Um, so it's about going back to revisit every decision when somebody asks for a decision or asks for something uh, and not just carrying things over from the past. Um, and, and it's also about trying to predict that when you make a uh, focus on one particular decision to anticipate that there will be other decisions that flow from that decision. And so they were much more conscious of that and beginning to talk to people about the need to anticipate future decisions. This is three, which is about obtaining customer views and preferences. Uh, and, and people felt this was really central to their change practice. So, you know, that much more about giving people options and, and refocusing about exploring options. And, and people along the way talked about the types of strategies that they used in order to do this, to help people explore options and to make sure that people were understanding what the possibilities were. So as one says, I like to get them to repeat it back to me. I like to use lots of questions so you can see whether somebody's really understanding what the possibilities are. So there was a lot of really good communication happening and understanding that you need to keep asking and explaining and checking if somebody's going to really exercise some choice and you're going to understand their preferences. This step four is about identifying constraints um, and making uh, priorities out of all the possible options you might have. And they talked a lot about um, supporting people to understand the financial realities. Obviously, most of the people that the public trustee officers deal with are people on, on low incomes. And so they talked about what we call enabling risk. Uh, for me, it's trying to work out, are there other ways of achieving what the customer wants that isn't perhaps quite what they came in with? but it isn't also saying, no, that's not possible. So can you, can you keep somebody's preference, but, but maybe um, find another way of, of enacting that, that maybe the person can afford, um, or that maybe isn't quite so risky. Um, this is step five that I sort of talked about before, which is understanding, uh, undertaking a structured process. And, the, again, there were mixed views with staff here. So some said, you know, I use the wheel to remind me about the process at this point to do a bit of reflection. She says, I have my wheel sitting up on my desk so I can see it's there. So it's just visual that reminds 
and it reminds you as well, have you gone through this process? Whereas some of the other staff thought um, that it really was a bit weird. You didn't need this step. And I think that's something that's worth thinking about if there's some revisions done in this context. You know, it just says undertake a structured process. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then it's step five. Shouldn't that be step one? Um, and, and it's like, I think the person's missed and maybe there's not enough on the wheel itself that says stop and reflect. Have you undertaken a structured process rather than just this instruction to do a structured process? But this person is saying, well, that should just be at the beginning. Um, and then reaching the decision and the associated decisions. Um, and only a few staff felt this was important, particularly where they might be supporting somebody to take some legal action about their money, uh, about maybe contesting a will or uh, renting out a property or something like that, that once you make one decision, there's likely to be a whole lot of decisions that flow from that. Um, and you'll have to be ready to deal with all those other decisions. Um, and that's that's really important for people um, in terms of understanding what's what's coming along in the future and being able to get ready to think about some of those. And then this last uh, step is about actioning and evidencing the decision. And this is really important in this type of context. Um, there were mixed views from staff about the responsibility for actioning a decision. Some staff felt that that actually wasn't their role to put the decision into action, that that was the role of, of the person themselves or their family or their advocates. So it's not, uh, our argument is that it's not a decision until, until it's been acted on. Um, and in the original uh, framework, finding an advocate, making sure there's somebody to implement the decision is really important. Um, the staff here weren't quite so sure about their role in that. And that's probably something that needs to be clarified. But the other part of this step is about evidencing. Um, so the staff recognize the value of, of documenting the decision. So at this point, they were expected to document the process that they'd gone through so that it was transparent, uh, so that it could be reviewed by their supervisor if necessary, um, and it would be defensible as having gone through a rights-based process. Um, and they hadn't done that before, they said. So our previous documenting maybe only have been two or three lines. So the staff thought this was useful, but they also saw it was fairly onerous um, and time consuming. And that's a sort of management issue that the office needs to think about and making sure people have got time to do that type of documentation. Uh, in terms of the principles, um, people, very few people explicitly talked about using the principles, but you could hear it in their language. So they were certainly involving more people in people's support networks than they used to. They were using well, the language of rights. They were very much more careful about their wording. Um, and they were certainly uh, seeing the value of reflecting and reviewing uh, their actions and taking time uh, before they actually made a final decision with the person. So, the question then is, is the framework embedded in QPT? Uh, the staff suggested that it was. Uh, they said, you know, well, it's discussed at staff meetings. It's used by supervisors to review decisions. And it's become embedded in the templates and the documentation that's required by the office. So this is a supervisor saying, you know, she, she sends submissions to make decisions back to the person, to the officer concerned if they haven't documented and made it clear that they've attempted to seek the person's views and wishes. So it's become embedded in the processes of this organization. And another one talked about the coaching tools that they've developed around this and the monthly coaching sessions that they've been having with staff. Um, there were some staff who weren't really convinced about the value of this new way of, of working. They, they felt there was still this tension between people's rights and their role in, in protecting people. And so one of them sort of said, I feel like we've lost our way a bit. We're just giving customers money every time they ring up and request it. So there's a sort of feeling of, 
there's a bit of paternalism that's still sort of there. Why shouldn't people get their money when they ring up and request it? Um, you're, it's, it's, and so shifting that attitude about protecting people, but still keeping some of that there to make sure you're enabling people to take risks rather than you're stopping them from taking risks. I think, and that's a very sort of fine line uh, which is very nuanced and I think will take a long time to sort of settle into this office. And it's clear that there was also uh, a need for some additional training about working with people with mental health problems. So staff felt they didn't have enough skills to do that. So just to finish off, um, the participants thought, perceived that Queensland Public Trustees had refocused and had become more customer uh, centred and orientated to, towards rights. They perceived that there was much greater accountability in this new way of working to both customers and the organisation, and they valued this clear process and principles in the new framework to guide their life. It was a small sample, uh, but it was a significantly, statistically significant change that, that we were able to find in terms of a shift towards rights-based support strategies from the staff that were in that sample. Um, they saw there's this inherent tension between a procedural approach and being person-centered that requires the application of principles and processes. And I guess that illustrates that you need to keep mentoring people, keep supporting people to think about how you apply the principles to each individual. The comments from staff suggest that there's a need to develop and work through some more case studies that are focused on some of the more complex issues, this tension between rights and risk and, and rights and protecting people that confront the frontline Queensland public uh, trustee staff. There's a sense that the staff feel they're dealing with some very difficult cases and maybe the training didn't, didn't provide enough support around those. And then you get this sense, well, they don't really understand what we do. Um, so that, that probably needs some more work. Um, I think one of the issues is the challenge to maintain this momentum of change um, and keep, keep it embedded, which means you need to do this training with induction for new staff, you need refresher training, you need sort of advanced training for people so that it keeps alive as this is the practice that we use in this organisation. And it's been through a few upheavals, this organisation, but I think it's very committed um, to continuing to, to further the use of this rights-based framework. Um, and I think it, it's a lesson in a sense that if a big organization can have these type of results in this context of a very difficult context of, of, of COVID when this was happening, um, that it's possible for this type of change to start to happen in other public trustee organizations. So it will be really useful uh, for this, this sort of study and the experiences of Queensland public trustee to be shared with the other trustee organisations. And I guess just to finish off, the types of change that we found in the public trustee were very similar to those that we found in earlier studies of the Latrobe framework with service coordinators, uh, uh, people with acquired uh, disabilities, and with parents of adults with intellectual disabilities. So it's, it's telling us something about the sort of the common elements in support for decision-making that need to be, uh, people need to understand and need to develop those skills, but that you can embed that sense of good practice for support for decision-making in different types of contexts um, and, and tailor it to those contexts, but it's not fundamentally different in different contexts. It's the same set of principles and practice. So I might stop there, Jacinta, and hand back to you.